What's up guys, I wanted to hop in here real quick before the episode started and remind you at this point in the video, we've already washed and dried the car properly back in episode one. Now for episode two, we're chatting with Kevin Brown and talking about his three-step method for what he does, what he thinks about when he encounters black finicky paint. Now, most of us, we use our favorite pad, our favorite polish, our favorite machine. We do the car, looks great, we're happy. But what happens when we do that and it doesn't work out? We feel like it's hard paint, it's soft paint, there's too much residue, we can't finish it out. What do we do? We turn to Kevin and Kevin seems to figure it out. My purpose with this video is to kind of explore that and say like, what is it that you do? Like explain this whole process. And I really think um, kind of understanding this nugget of information from him is so powerful as we go forward. So with all that being said, I hope you enjoy episode number two. All right, Kevin, for detailers around the world, Polishing out black paint is a complete nightmare as we know. You think about it differently, and I love chatting with you about this because there's a process that you go through. Can you explain that? Well, it's not more difficult. It's just more noticeable what you're doing. You, what, what your input is and your output is, is more noticeable. Right. So I try to keep it simple by breaking things down into three separate categories. The first being, we have to make sure we're contamination free. And that includes your environment, your pads, uh, the paint, of course, you right. know, clayed and, and, and wiped down. The second thing is we focus on the defects. We're not going to worry about haziness or uh, doing too vast of an area. Focus on removing the defects, eliminate the defects. And then finally, we refine the finish to give it that final pop and clarity we're, looking, we're all looking for. Okay, when working on any paint, especially black finicky paint, you must have a contaminant-free surface. Now, I know most of you watching this are saying, yeah, of course, it's gotta be clean, that's why we just washed it. But what you may not realize is that even five or six minutes of just being outside after the wash, as we pulled it indoors, dust and tiny bird droppings actually accumulated within seconds of completing the wash. So be aware that even though you may have just washed the car, the surface may not be 100% contaminant free when the time comes for your buffing and polishing. It's a subtlety you can't overlook. The quickest way to remove dust is to use clean compressed air to blow it away, but be careful not to blow the dust on other parts of the car and chase your tail in circles. Most people, however, choose to wipe the light dust with a spray detailer. Although this too is quick and easy, it tends to be the source of most issues for many detailers without them realizing the problem. Some spray wax and spray sealants, commonly called spray detailers, contain polymers and various protectants that create a barrier layer on top of the clear coat, which blocks or interferes with the compound and pad touching the clear coat when buffing. So be conscious to avoid unintentionally adding contamination yourself when trying to clean the dust off prior to buffing. Lastly, if your paint feels rough to the touch, but it's clean, then you may have something called embedded contaminants that differ from the surface contaminants, such as the dust and the fresh bird poo we discussed earlier. Embedded contaminants will not be removed by washing or wiping with spray detailers, and they feel like little bumps on your paint. These bumps may interfere with the buffing pad once again. To remove them without introducing more contaminants, use a clay bar and clay lubricant and quick back and forth motions with little to no downward pressure. Once it feels smooth after one or two passes, move to the next area. I did ask Kevin about using isopropyl alcohol mixtures or heavy wax removers to eliminate the film or strip the paint, but he warned about this practice for two reasons. Number one, it tends to dry out the paint or clear coat with excessive use, much the same as having dry skin on your hands. And second, one product is usually not enough. You need different types of solvents to get all the different contaminants off, which is extremely harsh on your delicate and thin clear coats and can actually change the structure of the paint, causing excessive heat buildup when compounding. So the moral of the story is this. Sometimes it's just safer to slowly grind away the contaminants with a polisher than to hit it with a chemical bazooka. Ultimately, step one is really about preparing the paint properly before polishing by choosing a coating or polymer-free spray detailer and removing embedded contaminants. But what if you think you did everything you could to prep the paint properly, but it's still acting weird or unusual? What do you do now? When the normal techniques don't work, then we have to change what we're doing. And one of the best ways to do that is to increase the quantity of buffing liquid. In the case where you have a invisible contamination, right. uh, a silicone, a polymer, or a wax. That you don't know is on there. Yeah, you, you wiped it down, you thought you got it removed, you can't tell, but when you start buffing, it's not working like it used to. Very likely, 
that's the problem. So when you increase the quantity of buffing liquid, it helps to keep that emulsified so that the pad can continue to move the product around. The abrasive can grind away uh, the, the paint. As a point of reference, a typical amount of buffing liquid used on the pad after it's primed is roughly three pea-sized drops. However, in this scenario, our normal routine is not working, so Kevin increases the amount to roughly nine to 10 pea-sized drops on a primed pad, far more liquid than normal. This is in preparation for our next step, referred to as a mow down compounding cycle. So for step two, which is defect removal, we first need to mow down the area. I wanna move the machine nice and slow so that we get work done. And with that quantity of liquid, it helps to keep the temperature down to a degree, keeps things flowing along. Now, as you can tell, it's very difficult to see what's occurring. So during a mow down, it's very challenging to see because you actually have a, more liquid and you can't, you can't see the paint at this point. Right, so we're gonna do a couple of passes and we're going to stop. And just as you did that, you saw how easy that was to remove. Right. If this was one of those problematic or finicky paints, you would have done that and that liquid would have stayed in place. And that would have been because we had encompassed the quantity of buffing liquid with paint residue and it just caused it to really stick. Sometimes after compounding, when you try to wipe the compounding residue off the paint, it'll become sticky or grippy when wiping with your towel. This is a great indication that you may have increased residue or old single stage paint, for example. A quick trick when you find yourself in this spot is to simply add a squirt or two of water to help loosen the impacted old dead paint and buffing liquid to then scoop it up with a microfiber towel. But because Kevin used more liquid here in the mow down cycle, the paint residue and liquid did not run out of moisture and grip to the paint, so we avoided that issue altogether. Okay, after the mow down technique, we move into the final cut. What's the difference between mowing down the paint and this final cut? Well, once you've got the mow down handled, it has eliminated 70 or 80% of all the defects anyway, so your work's actually easier. And then with the 20 to 30% that's left, how do you, like, how do you go after it? How do you sniper it? We use a more traditional approach. And in this case, uh, if you have compressed air, clean the pad you're using and eliminate all that extra buffing liquid. And if we you had, don't have compressed air? It's, it's very simple just to change the pad. And again, in the case of these, these pads, the microfiber, best to apply some of the buffing liquid and we have to season or prime the pad. And that just simply means spread it around. Make sure it's moist, make sure that it's distributed evenly. If this is a string, you know, if this is a fiber. I wanna make sure it's encompassed with buffing liquid which has abrasive in it. So if it drags across that surface, there's a very good chance it's gonna cut away paint. And, and when you have this quantity of strings, it happens rapidly. Right, and most people, I, you know, you see traditionally, you know, you put your one there, one dot, three dots, and then they just put it down. It, it, and at that point, if right. your string is encoded, all in your product, what, what happens well, to- Well, not only that, but microfiber, since it is so good at grabbing and holding, right. that dot will not spread such as it might on a, a slippery or foam So pad. if the dot was over here and there's nothing, and over here is dry, what happens to the paint? Well, you're, you're gonna, that's gonna get work done for a little while, but right. since it's not able to move around and slide around, that's gonna be encompassed with the paint we're grinding away, right. the paint residue. All right, so priming okay. the pad is obviously critical It helps here. things move around, it, it just increases the efficiency of cut, does all kinds of great things for this step. All right, so the difference, the main difference between the mow down and final cut is you're kind of reducing the amount of liquid. You're backing down the quantity of buffing liquid. Now we can see the defect, we can yeah. go after that particular one. And that's one of the reasons we back it down because I wanna be able to target the, the defect removal, see what I'm doing, and as it's being eliminated or it's completely Right, gone, that's actually stop. a really good point because when we're doing the mow down, there's, there's so much liquid on there, it's, it's fuzzy, it's blurry, it's, you, know, you, can't, you, can't see, yeah. you can't see the paint. So now you're, when you're backing it down, you can really just go after those individually. And we have to always be aware, every pass, every rotation, we are removing paint permanently. It's important to recognize there are two different processes within step number two. First is the mow down with way more liquid. Second is the final cut, which targets the remaining defects with way less liquid and lots of blowing out or switching to fresh pads that have no residue. This combination of techniques is also known as backing down the paint or taking half steps to control the residue properly. 
In this final cutting method of step number two, you're just sort of snipering the really bad defects that didn't come out earlier. This extra step is unbelievably noticeable after the final polishing in step number three. So if you take your time now, then your final finish will be perfect. After the final cut, the defects are gone and the paint looks amazing. Mm -hmm. But how do we get to that last 10%? Because I see a little bit of haze here. We're gonna make some big changes to our, our polishing setup, our pad and our liquid. We're switching to a finishing polish and a finishing pad. Okay. It's gonna dramatically draw back the ability to cut paint or the aggressiveness of the cut. Which would induce more haze if you did. Right, we're just trying to continually back things down. We're gonna minimize the number of passes and minimize the quantity of buffing liquid we're using. With your favorite finishing pad, lightly prime with three or four small dots and rub them into the pores of the foam. Your focus now should be on the number of passes and the amount of liquid used. In this case, using less is way more helpful. Likewise, your speed is a variable that can't be determined via a video or an email. The amount of pressure, the type of pad, and the amount of residue will all affect the rotation of the pad. However, a good rule of thumb is to have one to two pad rotations per second, so you'll need to adjust your speed and pressure based on your paint's unique variables. I think that's shocking to a lot of people that it's that, you know, it's that you didn't spend 20, 20 minutes on right. refining. Right, and, and there's a chance that we didn't get all of the cut or, or, or refining that we needed, but we can do another pass. I kind of think of it like archaeology when there's like a bone or something in there and they just, just barely going at it with a little brush, well, right? You've done vehicles or you, you chase your tail right. constantly. It's like, wow, you, yeah. you have to avoid contaminating the pad with the paint residue. You've got to control that residue. And if you do too many passes, especially with that minuscule quantity of liquid, it doesn't have the ability to coat that pad and help it resist things attaching to it, right? right. So that's why I say look for oiliness. If you see oiliness, even if you don't see an abundance of white liquid, you don't want to see that. Right. But you do want to see that oiliness. That indicates there is still some moisture on the pad and that oiliness is help protect that pad from things attaching and locking onto it. Because when that happens and you've got debris stuck, now you're scouring again. Now, now we wipe it off and do what? Just check Just our work? Just inspect it. We're gonna use an inspection light and see what that did. Next, we wipe with a clean microfiber towel and inspect the paint. Again, this is a slow and steady process. The paint looks much better now, but it still needs more work. Depending on the pad, product, and paint variables, this can be a simple one-pass process or more. It's really different on all paints, so there's no way to give you a rule of thumb. But what you should see is a light layer of oil or a sheen as you wipe the panel clean. This can be a healthy indicator that we haven't overloaded the pad with extra residue, which would cause us to re-scour the paint and then start over again. So it's easy to chase your tail if these methodologies are not recognized and practiced on these finicky paints. And once in a while you'll get everything looking flawless, but there might be one little pigtail mark or one little section, and then we can focus on that. But for the most part, when you've done your re refining properly or your defect removal and you're refining that, it's usually pretty simple. What are you going to say at the end of this video to somebody when they're panicking about going outside? Like, how do you motivate them to do this? Well, it's, it's, it's not a black magic. It's a, it's a science. If you do the things that we talked about, if you use the tips and tricks to help you along the way, and you stick to the, that plan. Do your mow down, clean your pad off and clean the surface off and back things down, back down the quantities of liquid, back down the number of passes as you get finer and finer or more refined. Right, and, and then make it, sure the paint doesn't have any contamination on it, you know what I mean? Oh, that's the number one thing. It, right. You have to start there. If you don't make sure, if you don't ensure that you are contamination free, you're never going to get to the last step of perfection. I think from my perspective, after all this talking and learning from you, one of the things, is, um, the biggest or the broadest concept is if something you're doing isn't working, that, you know, that thing that you normally go to all the time and it hasn't worked, you, ha you kind of have to stop, breathe, and reassess what you're doing and then say, hey, why don't we go down a different path? And this path, a lot of people, I, I don't know which path to go down, and you're sort of mapping out one, two, three, uh, right. you know, and try right. that and, and you may have a different result with that. That's right. And even in the midst of uh, being a professional, myself, there'll be times where everything's working properly and then something changes. It's like, wow, I've been doing everything the way I'm supposed to and I'm not seeing the results I was getting there or there or there. Sometimes the pad, even though it's being blown out or cleaned, it's now got a micro uh, hazing of paint residue on it that's right. not easily blown away. Yeah. Gotta stop, change the pad, and inevitably I do that. It's like, oh, boom. 
There we go. So look for those little telltale signs that something's changed because something has changed. It's not, you, there's, there's a tendency to say, oh, this is, this is a nightmare paint. This is so difficult. Right. This is the softest paint. And you know what's interesting is that a lot of the times when people are working on the softest paint, it, turn, it turns out they're, they're not yeah. or vice versa. This is the hardest paint I've ever worked on. It's not. It's actually soft. It's just loaded that pad so quickly and encompassed the abrasive so rapidly it can't cut. Can't cut. Yeah. Yeah. So stick to the plans and the tips and tricks we've outlined today. I think you're going to have a phenomenal experience and a great result. After a few hours of polishing the paint with these rules in mind, the GT was looking amazing. Now it was time to add some glow to the finish. For that, Barry walked into the garage and gave Derek his Meguiar's Ultimate Pace Wax, which for whatever reason made me really happy. It was pretty cool to see a guy's name on his product used on his car coming out of his house. Sort of a surreal moment in the filming process for me. After our fresh polishing and waxing, Barry and I went for a ride along the coast and he showed me where he grew up and how the car culture and passion grew the Meguiar's brand from a commercially focused company originally to now both a professional and enthusiast product line which he later built and explains in detail in our interview in episode 3, so don't miss it. For more helpful how-to car care videos, visit AmmoNYC.com. As always, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.